And thanks everybody for coming today. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you about a catalyst technology we've been working on. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about our team first. I'm Jim Parks. Uh, together with Todd Tubes and Andrew Bender, uh, we work on automotive catalysts for clean fuel efficient engines. Um, but there's some other members of the team that are important here too. Shang Dai is actually a uh, basic energy science uh, expert here at, at ORNL. So we team with him, he works in another division, uh, but he's part of the uh, invention that we'll be talking about today. We added Beth Armstrong to the team as well. She's in the material sciences uh, division here at ORNL. She's an expert on coatings, which is part of our scale up process. And then David Sims is our uh, commercialization manager for the technology. So the, the work that uh, you'll hear about has been going on at the National Transportation Research Center. Um, there's you know, a chance to tour that uh, this afternoon. I wanted to talk a little bit about this, just show this slide here, a little bit about what the NTRC is. It's actually a user facility. It's actually the only transportation-based user facility for the Department of Energy. What that means is actually people come to our laboratories to work with us. But the main point I wanna make with this slide is that we're very accustomed to working with industry and we work with industry all the time. Our, our projects that are funded by DOE are very much applied projects. We have industry partners, we have a lot of input. We have CRADAs, which are partnerships with, with companies, uh, a lot of visiting uh, projects and, and also strategic uh, partnership projects, which are, are projects funded by industry at our laboratory. And if you look at our transportation program here at Oak Ridge National Lab, it's very broad. And the way we look at it, there's no silver bullet for transportation. There's a lot of different technologies that are gonna be in play. Uh, you've heard a lot about electrification of, of uh, vehicles. Uh, even uh, this week, GM announced uh, uh, that there's gonna be you know, a big shift towards electric vehicles for their fleets. Uh, we've continued to hear that. There's some cities that are saying, we're gonna ban the internal combustion engine and so forth. Well, uh, the experts say, actually there's gonna be internal combustion engines in all vehicles. 90% of vehicles by up to 2050 or so. Um, so we do see electrification taking root, advancing, but we also see the continued use of internal combustion engines. At ORNL, we're working on all these different technologies. We're working on better batteries, uh, better ways to charge vehicles. Uh, we're working on internal combustion engines, alternative fuels, uh, also lightweight materials and so forth. In fact, you'll hear a carbon fiber uh, talk today by a minute. So, I just wanted to make the point that there's a lot of different things that are going on in our transportation uh, program. And so I'll just be talking about one of them uh, here. And so what's the driver for the technology I'm talking to you about today? Well, the driver is really emission regulations. If you look at the automotive company, particularly the auto, automotive industry, particularly the light duty, the passenger car market, they're under intense pressure right now because they have two major regulations coming down the pipe, uh, all to be phased in eventually by 20. 25. Uh, the first is uh, fuel economy standards, and that's calling uh, for reductions to 2025 in terms of fuel use. The second is EPA's tier three emission regulations. Uh, particularly on the emission regulations, we're looking at reducing the NOx and hydrocarbons by 70 to 85%, and those two are actually combined in the same bin for the regulation. Also, particulate matter emissions are coming down. So to meet any one of these regulations is actually very tough, but to meet them together is even much more tougher. And that's because the relationship between those two regulations is very important. You can do great things to improve the fuel efficiency of the vehicle, but how do you also get it to be cleaner? Well, that's where our catalyst technology comes into play. Uh, if you look at uh, conventional engines, if you look over at the left here, uh, you see the uh, uh, conventional uh, stoichiometric engine uh, Temperatures and exhaust temperatures, as we make these engines more efficient, including using advanced low temperature combustion engines, which run lean, their exhaust temperatures reduced. Okay, and that's where we get into this interlink between the two regulations here. As you make the engine more efficient, lower exhaust temperatures, that's more of a challenge for catalysts. So then how do you meet the emission regulations? Okay, well, that's a challenge. And that's where we come in. We've been working on catalysts that work at lower temperatures to get to better performance. And this is not something, you know, we just kind of, oh, let's go in the lab and invent, invent something today. You know, it's, it's always kind of, I think, what people think about inventions. But this is actually something we've thought about a lot. Uh, we've been working uh, for decades with the automotive industry, both the light duty and also the heavy duty uh, truck markets. 
In fact, uh, this week, uh, I, I'm leaving on a plane to go attend our CLEARS workshop, which is a workshop we actually host in the Detroit area for emission control devices for the Department of Energy. There'll be a lot of industry there, universities and other national labs. But as part of the CLEARS uh, organization that we run, uh, we actually do an industry survey to ask the industry, what do you need help on? And, and also we work with uh, two major government industry partnerships, the 21st Century Truck Partnership, that's the heavy duty uh, engine companies, and then US Drive, that's the big three, GM, Fiat Chrysler, Automobile, and Ford. And so together, they, they actually have called out help in this area for lower, uh, better per catalysts at lower temperatures. And as a result, the Vehicle Technologies Office at Department of Energy has established the goal to get 90% conversion of CO, hydrocarbons, and NOx at 150 degrees Celsius. We're not there yet, but our technology has made great progress towards that goal and definitely has an advantage. So I just wanted to point out that this is something that industry has been calling us to work on, and so that's what we've been doing to respond. A little bit about uh, combustion and advanced combustion. Um, I'm not an expert in this. We have many experts at the National Transportation Research Center. My, my expertise is more in the catalysis area. But if you look at uh, combustion technologies, on the left we have the traditional spark ignition uh, gasoline engine. And then on the right we have uh, the diesel engine. And they're very different because uh, the way the fuel actually burns in the cylinder. Uh, on the right, when you have the, the diesel, it actually is compression ignition versus the spark ignition for the gasoline. Well, the new uh, low temperature combustion technologies that have been worked on are actually hybrids in a, in, a, in a way of those two engine technologies. What they try to do is create a homogeneous uh, fuel mixture inside the cylinder and then burn that with either spark ignition or compression ignition, more typically it's being done with compression ignition. And in that case, because it's a homogeneous mixture, you can get lower NOx and PM. This is important because it does reduce the upstream cost for lean engines. Uh, however, in the process, you get higher CO and hydrocarbons right now because the controls for that homogeneous mixture are not as good. Um, also, what happens is the temperatures get lower, which makes it challenging for catalysts. Now, the advantage of these engines is, is greater fuel efficiency and the lower NOx and PM emissions. Uh, this is one of the technologies that, that's in the, classified as a low temperature combustion called RCCI, which is reactivity control compression ignition. This is a, one of the low temperature combustion technologies we demonstrated at the National Transportation Research Center on a multi-cylinder uh, engine. And you can see this is a modeled fuel economy from the engine results that we got. Uh, much better fuel economy than even diesels and uh, significantly better than port fuel injected gasoline engines. So there's a lot of opportunity here to get better fuel economy with these technologies. But one of the problems is the higher CO and, and hydrocarbon emissions from the technologies. This, these plots show a diesel, which is a CDC, which stands for clean diesel uh, combustion versus the RCCI, this low temperature combustion mode. You can see that the NOx and PM emissions are greatly reduced by the RCCI mode due to the homogeneous combustion but the CO and hydrocarbon is actually higher for our OCCI. So now we have kind of two problems. One is lower exhaust temperatures. Second is higher CO and hydrocarbons. And this becomes a problem for catalysts kind of twice over because what happens in a catalyst when you have CO and hydrocarbons together is they actually compete for the catalyst site. Uh, these are some literature uh, results that show this effect that as you add hydrocarbons on the left, you actually see a decrease in the NOx conversion. The same thing on the right, this is uh, showing conversion for both CO and hydrocarbons. As you increase the higher and, and use higher CO and hydrocarbons for the RCCI mode, you get a shift to the higher temperatures for the light off of the, of the, of the catalyst to, to be effective. And that's the real problem here that we're trying to address with this innovation that we'll talk to you about today. And here's a little bit better schematic on what happens on a catalyst when you have this inhibition problem with the hydrocarbons and CO competing on the catalyst. At the top, you see a, a palladium uh, catalyst, and it's very happy. It's seeing hydrocarbons come on. The hydrocarbons are burning with the oxygen to produce water and CO2. Uh, it becomes warm, hot, becomes even better at doing the catalysis as you have good conversion at, at low temperatures. But once you put in the CO into the mix, which is shown on the lower part of the screen, then the CO can chemisorb onto the catalyst, prevent the hydrocarbons from getting there. Then the catalyst isn't getting hot because it's not burning anything. And then you have a shift to higher temperatures. You require higher temperatures to get the same conversion. So this is called inhibition. It's a very fundamental 
problem for catalysis. We've known about it for decades, uh, but our catalyst technology really helps with this, and that's the advantage that we have. So what we did is we actually looked at the new catalyst that was a mixture of copper, cobalt, and ceria oxides. We call it CCC because it's a mixture of those three oxides. And actually this catalyst was being studied in our basic energy sciences team. So they're looking at it more from a fundamental standpoint. Found that it had really low temperatures for CO oxidation. Uh, because of that, we took a closer look in automotive exhaust conditions. But the first thing we saw is that the CO was a, in fact very good low temperature. This is shown with the red curve on the upper, upper plot. However, the hydrocarbon conversion wasn't very good for the CCC. Um, but what was really interesting to us was when we actually looked at the effect of the hydrocarbons on the CO oxidation. And you can see on the lower right, the red uh, curves and then the uh, dotted line curves for the CCC catalysts lay exactly on top of each other, regardless of whether there's hydrocarbons in the stream or not. So this is a major breakthrough because inhibition has been very common to all platinum group metal catalysts. Yet for this catalyst, we don't see it at all. In contrast, for the palladium catalyst shown here, you see a big shift of about 50 degrees Celsius higher in the light off. So worse performing when you have that mixture of the hydrocarbons and CO. So this is this, this no inhibition uh, effect from the CCC catalyst is what we've been taking advantage of for the innovation. What we found though, because it wasn't very good hydrocarbon oxidation with the CCC catalyst is that we got the best results by mixing the catalyst with the platinum group metal catalyst. So this, uh, these results here are, were some of the early results shown from a powder-based catalyst. It shows the CCC catalyst in black, a platinum alumina catalyst in blue, and then in red, the CCC catalyst and platinum catalyst mixture uh, with 50% less platinum overall. You can see the CO oxidation was better with the mixture of the CCC and platinum versus the platinum, which is kind of our baseline. Then for hydrocarbons, we got an even lower uh, performance with the mixture than either one of the catalysts alone. And it depends somewhat on the hydrocarbon. Um, propane is a hard, harder hydrocarbon to oxidize, so higher temperatures. But here again, the CCC mixture with the platinum group metal catalyst uh, was the best. So this is a major advantage to have a lower temperature activity uh, in a mixture stream where you have lots of CO and hydrocarbon together. And that's, that's the core of our innovation. Uh, this is just kind of a summary slide. Again, a lot of this came from our basic energy science research that was going on. We didn't find out until we used it in the applied sense that we have this uh, real advantage uh, to overcome the inhibition problem. But that's led to, on the right, this better performance with 50% platinum group metal. So there's definitely a lower cost benefit to this. Okay, so what are we doing now? So uh, we're working on the, the catalyst uh, technology and trying to advance it in this TIP program, which has been uh, really exciting for us. But if you look at catalysts, what do we need to do? You know, what, from a commercial standpoint, what do we need for a catalyst to be successful? And so here's the list, the really basic list that I have uh, to talk about that. Uh, one thing you need is you need to have some fundamental understanding of the function of the catalyst. But we've been working with industry long enough to know that the chief engineers, they don't like snake oil and black boxes. They want to know how a technology works. And there's really good reason for that when you think about the warranty exposure that that chief engineer is, is, is under in terms of pressure there. And everybody knows about the VW scandal and what happened there. And that's, that shows you about warranty exposure. And think about all the fines that you could have to pay if you don't meet emission regulations and so forth. That's why they're very serious about when they look at a technology, they want to know what the performance and the spec sheet for that uh, uh, technology is about, but they also want to know a fundamental understanding of how and why the catalyst works or any technology works. So that's, that's the number one thing, and, and we do have information related to that. The second is that, of course, you have to meet the emission regulations, but you have to do it cost effectively. Right now, as they're planning for the 2025 fuel economy and emission uh, regulation standards to meet those, they, they do analysis all the time for all technologies and they do it on a, on a dollar basis. So they're looking at you know, how many uh, grams of CO2 they can reduce per dollar for the technology. And that's how they rank all the technologies. And that's why you look, when, they, when they're looking at the technologies, they're look, looking at a variety of technologies, just like we're doing a research of all these variety of technologies as well. They're gonna compare a battery electric vehicle 
to a traditional internal combustion engine vehicle and hybrids of all varying degrees in looking at this. And every component you add is an additional cost. Every component you add you know, was gonna help you to you know, lessen the amount of CO2, get better fuel economy and, and meet the emission regulations. So that's, that's a key uh, factor, the cost effectiveness of the technology. Um, third, we have to meet the durability requirement. That's the question we get a lot from the catalyst scientists in industry. They wanna know about the durability because it's not just meeting the regulation on a new vehicle, it's at what's classified in regulation as full useful life. And so what does that mean for automotive? For automotive and light duty, these are passenger car vehicles, full useful life is 150,000 miles. That's what they're looking for. For heavy duty, it's quite a bit more. It's 435,000 miles for a heavy duty truck. And that sounds a lot, and it is a lot. It's, it's quite strict of a regulation there. But of course, a heavy duty truck, an 18 wheeler type truck, will go a million miles before it has to be rebuilt. So they're looking for, the, for a lot longer lifetime for the heavy duty applications. Now, I don't have on here stationary power generation, but that's another thing we're looking at with this technology. Uh, in those cases, the durability requirements vary depending on the site, what air quality management district you're in, and so forth. So there's a lot of different factors that go into the, the durability requirements and also the emission regulations for stationary power. But that's definitely something that our catalyst could work with. Uh, and then the fourth is that we need to be able to manufacture this with a scalable process. You know, if you can't make it, in, in large quantities, then it's not gonna be uh, effective from a, a business standpoint. So I just have a few slides now to talk about uh, some of these uh, aspects of the commercialization that, we, that we've been looking at. So the first is kind of a fundamental understanding of how the technology works. And so we've been doing research on the catalyst uh, using a, a technique called DRIS, which stands for Diffuse Reflectance Infrared Fourier Transform Spectroscopy. Obviously it's a lot easier to say DRIS. <laughs> Um, and what the DRIS does is actually DRIS takes infrared light and shines it onto the catalyst, and then you look at the absorbed infrared light. Infrared light is used because the infrared energies and wavelengths are the, the energies that chemical bonds have. So when you have a chemical bond on the surface of the sample you're analyzing, then you'll see an absorption feature, or some of the infrared light intensity reduced, when you have that chemical bond. So we use drifts to understand the surface chemistry um, of our catalyst. And we can actually do this in an active stream. So we actually put the sample uh, in the drift instrument and we'll actually flow gases of the cow so we can watch things happen as, as they're occurring. And that's what this data is. Um, in the upper left, we have two plots. One on the left is for the CCC catalyst alone. The one on the right is for a palladium-based catalyst. And what we're looking at is we, we look at the, the, we put CO on the catalyst and when they added, added hydrocarbons. And then by looking at the different shifts in the, in the peaks and the different growths in the peaks, we can understand better about the catalyst. And what you notice is that on the right, the palladium catalyst, as you start adding the hydrocarbons, you see a large growth in the hydrocarbon absorption on that surface. But if you look at the CCC catalyst on the left, you see that there's not hardly any growth in the hydrocarbon region. That's the region on, on the left there. And so what that indicates to us is that the hydrocarbons aren't actually absorbing, can be absorbed onto the CCC catalyst, which is part of the reason why it makes it effective at continuing to convert the CO in the presence of CO, of hydrocarbons. The hydrocarbons aren't able to can absorb and affect that CO oxidation. So that's one thing we've been doing. The other thing we've done is we looked at different uh, combinations of the materials. We've looked at binary uh, combinations as well as ternary to try to isolate the effectiveness of the different uh, uh, combinations of the materials and how they act as, as, as active sites for catalysis. And through that, we've learned that there is definitely a uniqueness to the fact that we have the three uh, materials working together. And, and that uh, we have some theories about the oxidation sites for both the CO and the hydrocarbons and how they relate to the different specific materials with cobalt actually being the only one active for any of the hydrocarbon oxidation, which explains why the CCC alone is, is not very good for hydrocarbons. But that's also explains why uh, the effectiveness of them for the CO oxidation while when we mix it with the platinum grip metal, we have a very good CO oxidation and can keep the catalyst lit off at low temperatures. So those are some of the fundamental studies we've been using to understand the catalyst. 
the second point we were talking about was emission regulations, meeting them cost effectively. So um, the key here is that we're able to achieve better performance with even less platinum group metal content in the catalyst. And the platinum group metal content is the highest uh, cost uh, factor for the catalyst. Um, in fact, uh, if you look at a typical automotive catalyst, you're talking about $145 or so of, of platinum group metals in the catalyst. Um, and our catalyst, you know, takes advantage of the ability to oxidize the CO and hydrocarbons at different sites, which that's a fundamental advantage of the platinum group metal catalyst. And that's why we can get away with using less platinum group metal columns. So as a performance benefit, we have lower light off temperature. That's a performance benefit, which can, you know, can enable you to achieve the, the certification emissions. But also there's potential to have a lower PGM loading overall. And that's really important, not only from the standpoint of just the overall cost, but it's important to the business model when you look at automotive companies. Because when they look at designing a vehicle, that's typically a five year process or so. Okay, so if you're, if you've got your technologies in line, you're going to go engineer that new vehicle, and you're looking to understand how much that vehicle is going to cost. For then you also you're going to look at how much the platinum group metal uh, cost is. But as you can see, that changes over time. It goes up and down a lot, and there's a lot of different factors and reasons why. Um, but if you're looking five years ahead, it's hard to predict what that platinum group metal cost is going to be. That's why lowering it is actually a, you know, that gives you a great advantage because you're taking the risk and the, the accuracy of your cost predictions out of, out of the equation. So I wanted to emphasize that there's an additional advantage to the overall lower cost. There's also a cost on reducing the impact of volatility on these platinum group metal costs on the actual final product. Uh, so third, we have a durability requirement. Uh, to date, we haven't done long-term aging of the catalyst, but we've done accelerated aging of the catalyst primarily with hydrothermal aging. Hydrothermal aging just means you're including water in the aging. Uh, as we work with the industry, they have some uh, uh, common protocols for, for doing these types of accelerated aging studies for catalysts. Uh, so far, what we've seen is that the catalyst works very well uh, up to 800 degrees Celsius. So at 900 degrees Celsius, we do see a drop-off in the material stability. Um, so what that means right now is that for, for these results is that our catalysts really look good for these three applications, the low temperature combustion, which is the advanced combustion technologies, clean diesel combustion, and lean gasoline engines. The one where we need further stabilization is for stoichiometric gasoline engines. That's what's dominant in the fleet in terms of the light duty. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity for us to, to improve on this benefit by adding stabilizers and so forth. So that's something we're continuing to work on in the lab. Uh, but a lot of markets already were ready for in terms of these results. Of course, we have to do a lot longer term aging as we move forward. Uh, but the initial results on this are, are good. We've got some good temperature range up to 100 degrees Celsius that'll apply for a lot of the uh, op options in terms of combustion technologies. Another thing that's really important from the durability standpoint is the durability of the catalyst to poisons, uh, particular sulfur and other things that are in the fuel or the lubricant. Um, this is a, a common question we get when we're presenting, how does it do with sulfur? The industry's always asking us that. And so of course we're doing uh, research to do that. We actually use some uh, protocols defined by industry, uh, defined by the US Drive government industry uh, working groups uh, to test this. Uh, we look at the effect of sulfur on the catalyst all catalysts do worse with sulfur. So we do see a shift in the lateral curve with sulfation. The key is, can you get it back with desulfation? Desulfation is happening all the time on your automotive uh, catalysts that are on your vehicle. Um, and so what we can do, we found is that we can get recovery of the performance back with desulfation. And we also found that this mixture of the CCC with platinum is actually important to that. So there's a synergistic role uh, to the CCC and, and platinum, both from a performance standpoint, but also a durability standpoint. Okay, and so the last one is we need to be able to manufacture this with a scalable process, uh, and the TIP project that we're working on would be able to work on that. And we have some good news on that. Um, we originally did the, uh, the initial uh, manufacture of this or synthesis of this catalyst in the lab with a sol gel type method. Um, that's not that could be scaled up but a little bit more difficult than more of the traditional catalyst materials uh, techniques. We use a glycine nitrate production process, which is an oxidation type process for the metals. 
And what we found was actually got better performance with that process than we did with the solid gel process that we used in the lab. This is likely due to the higher surface area. We've confirmed in the uh, performance assessment that, that the material is better. We've also confirmed with x-ray diffraction analysis that we have a better material. And uh, the, the great news about this is it's a scalable process. We've already subcontract to Praxair to make us large volumes of this in kilogram batches and, and, and larger. And, and you can see, here's a picture of on the right, uh, this is the glycine nitrate versus the salt gel. And it's higher surface area, there's more material there uh, for the same weight. It's, and so that's part of how, why it does better in the catalysis. You want to maximize surface area to get the better performance. So that's, that's a good new, news uh, point of, uh, that we've already achieved in the, in the TIP program. As we move forward, we're going to continue to work on uh, getting the technology demonstrated on, on an engine that we expect to get results over the next month on that. Because we, we've already scaled up production of the material, which was task one. Uh, we're near ending the, the, the task two phase, which is where we've been coding this. Beth Armstrong has, has worked on coding the, the, the materials. She says it codes pretty well. We, we're now coding the large uh, catalysts for tests on our engines. That'll, that'll happen at the National Transportation Research Center. So that's, that's where we stand on the project. And uh, my last slide is just kind of a summary of the invention, the science behind it, and the performance advantage we get. So I'm happy to take any questions. So Jim, what do you think is a likely commercial adoption path for this technology? Is it first put into vehicle engines? Do you think somebody picks it up beforehand and you risk it? What do you think? So it'll depend uh, on the market itself. If you look at the largest market, which is light duty passenger market, that will probably take the longest time because there is a long process for evaluating technologies and getting in them, them into the, the vehicle uh, product line and, and then you know, to be adopted by those chief engineers. Um, there are other markets like the stationary market that you could put the catalyst into very rapidly. So some of the smaller markets like that, uh, you could develop technology, you could certify it and get it out there much more quicker. So the way we see it is that there, the, the, the options are uh, some of the, some catalyst companies, if they're wanting to play in the stationary market, could, could adopt the technology very quickly, get it out the door, get in the field and, and start running with it. Um, there's interest from the larger companies in the automotive space, but it'll take a little bit longer because with the larger market comes the larger warranty exposure. They have to make sure that the technology is going to perform and optimize it for those for that application. Keep in mind the technology will be a mixture, you know, with with other other catalyst components. So the catalyst has many functions, so that there's going to be some more engineering by the catalyst companies to get this to work too. From an industry standpoint, yeah. so I think we could go into the application and look at it there. So we've been studying this catalyst in 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 an application already, but um, specific to an application for a specific product, I think is where we want to go. So let's say we we're talking about that the the power generation. So you know, are we looking at one megawatt gensets, or are we looking at you know, little uh, 100 kilowatt gensets or even pumping stations out, out in the uh, oil fields. And so we would take a look at that application. We would want to understand the temperatures in the exhaust. We would understand the sulfur levels in the exhaust. And we would want to understand the, the, the baseline technologies that we're competing against and hone in on that and optimize the catalyst for that application. There's a lot to be gained there because we can get better performance at lower temperatures uh, with less cost. So it would be demonstrating that and engineering the catalyst to get to that point for that specific application. Okay. Yeah. Uh, to the, uh, to your point of maybe uh, 
Yeah, in terms of different hydrocarbon species yeah, and let's say in the big engine we use the hydrocarbon. Right, right. So, uh, yes. Yeah, this is gonna help you in all those cases. And in, in, in all the cases when you're competing against planet group metal classes, they're all gonna have problems with this inhibition problem. So you will have a benefit to this catalyst. Now the degree of the benefit will be specific to those conditions. What are the temperatures? what are the relative amounts of the hydrocarbons in the exhaust and the CO as well. And that depends a lot on the combustion technology. So for the low temperature combustion engines that I showed an example there, which are more future kind of looking in terms of the, the combustion technologies, they have the lowest temperatures, the highest CO and hydrocarbon levels. Our catalyst is gonna show a better benefit for that application than they would for uh, let's say a a lean gasoline engine, which may have some CO and hydrocarbons, but higher temperatures. So the benefits are gonna be dependent on that specific fuel and the combustion technology uh, area. But we think that there will be a benefit kind of regardless, it's just gonna be the, the magnitude of that benefit based on the emission regulation and everything. So we effectively just have to